I've entitled our message, uh, Carbonated Christians. Here's my little prop for today. Carbonated bre- beverages, obviously we know, are, we have the carbon dioxide, the CO2 inside of it that's added to this. And with that CO2, it begins to, when it begins to escape, it gets that fizzy drinks, their trademark uh, sensation of that esophagus. Es- Effervescence, that's hard to say, Uh, the fizziness, the bubbles, right? And uh, we also know what happens when it starts to get shaken, right? And we also know what happens when we are shaken. When worry comes into our lives, all of a sudden, it shakes us up inside. Uh, Something happens that alarms us, it's that shaking that takes place. Uh, We sense in our spirit uh, that uh, someone says something to us that we can't shake, uh, but it shakes us. Uh, We read something on Facebook or Instagram or our news feed, and, and that just spins us up and troubles us. The problem with the Thessalonian believers uh, that got them all shook up, uh, they're shook up over new prophecies, new letters that were coming their way, written in Paul's name that they thought were from him, new things that people were saying that, you know, they were claiming apostolic uh, authority. But Paul will comfort them by, no, we're not going to do that. Letting, but Paul comforts them by letting out the pressure, right? You know, and so we're all shaken up. And so with that, that's what we're going to see him doing. They're all shaken up, shaken up. And uh, we'll see that right in the text. Actually uses that word. And he's going to relieve the, the pressure from them, reminding them to, hey, just simply stick with what I've already shared with you. And so with that, you'll see on the bottom there are four points we'll look at there. I'm all shook up. It sounds like an Elvis song. Uh, Paul relieves the pressure. And then the last two are those who reject the truth and those who receive the truth. I thought after third service, I'm going to go hand this to some middle schooler out in the parking lot and bless them with a a Pepsi today. Actually, when Elvis wrote that song, they say the the writer of the song was in the uh, uh, studio and one of the owners came in and and had a Pepsi in his hand and was saying, I think you ought to write a a song about being all shooken up. So there's actually three different stories and Elvis gives one. uh, But anyways, that's why I chose Pepsi, but you're all welcome to it. Well, I got to give it to somebody at third service. So anyway, somebody will... I'll bless somebody today. All right, so we're in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. We'll just take the first uh, two verses at first. And he says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken. There's our word. In mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. That's the part that we're going to take so far. So first of all, our being gathered together into him, rapture. But then the day of the Lord, and I highlighted them both in a different color and, uh, behind me there, the day of the Lord being something different, the, the day of the judgment, the, the, the seven days, the seven days of tribulation, the seven years of tribulation. Because of the persecution that hit their church, they thought they're in the midst of it. So somebody had said, you guys missed the rapture. You're in the tribulation. Don't you feel it? Well, it's kind of like little p persecution and big p persecution, just as we'll take, talk about late, later, little a antichrists, plural, and big a antichrist, the antichrist. That's kind of what he's starting to lay out here. And so they were, uh, a shaking had occurred. And this word shaken, a restless tossing of a ship is another way uh, that we can look at that word or think of it. It's another way it was used. And so we pause for a second this morning and say, I I ask, what's shaking you up this week? Unexpected car repair, a bill you weren't expecting, a friend problem, a coworker, or maybe a boss problem, a big test coming up in school, turmoil in the home, freaking out about the next elections, waiting for the next proverbial shoe to drop, what's shaking you up this week? It's, it, we're we're going to hear from the same thing. Hey, 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 let's, let's settle down. Let's hear from, let's be reminded what God has told us when it comes to anxiety and worry and those kind of things. So listen to this morning. Because as was phrased in verse 2 here, I ask you this morning, I ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind. Because that happens. 
All of a sudden, we're, we're spinning on something that maybe sometimes might not even be a problem, but it could be. And so with it, it spins us up or alarmed. And there's a lot of alarmists running around in our world, or if you watch the news, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter. And so sometimes that happens even within the church. I have a word for you. I have a prophecy for you. And I know people that have been stuck for over 20 years because something prophesied over them that they don't have the gifts and callings to do. And so I would simply say, that wasn't from the Lord. We're supposed to test those things, right? Paul says that. John says that in his epistles. When somebody says that, you don't just automatically think that it is. I had one in all my life that I could remember, one that was spoken over me, and it actually came true. And it was actually beautiful, and I can still, you know, think about that. It was actually about me being a pastor. And and so with that, it was something that I was at the time, it was just like, man, it ain't gonna happen. And and then later it did, you know, and so, and it was a beautiful verse given to me, and I'll never forget it. Awesome. But there's other times people had said, right before, two days before I was leaving on a trip, I was taking a team of people, and they said, and and, uh, this lady came up to me and said, says, I believe I have a word for the Lord from you. You're not supposed to go on your trip. And I said, well, I very much appreciate your boldness in coming up and telling me that. This is the first time you visited here. You don't know me and those kind of things. And so that takes boldness. Tell me a little bit about it and go through that. And so, and then pretty soon it was going more than that, really warning me, you better not, you better not, you better not. And I said, no, what I need to do is I need to pray about this. To shut down a whole trip, that's a big deal. I've done it before, but it's rare when that takes place. And so that means everything up to this point, I haven't heard from the Lord. And so I'm not just going to quickly do that. And it ended up, we ended up still going on the trip. And there was no problems or anything like that. But we have to test the spirits in that way. And so as these things coming to us, as a spoken word, I have a word from the Lord for you. Or in their case, it was a letter supposedly from Paul, and all of a sudden they're, they're thinking it's from him, and what, what's up with that? And that's why he says in the very next chapter, there's only three chapters in 2 Thessalonians, the second to last thing he says is this, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. He didn't write his letters. He had uh, different guys writing it. He usually names them at the, at the end of his letters, but he always signs his signature, if you will, at the end. So he says, I, Paul, write this greeting. They put the greetings at the bottom of the letter instead of the top. I write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write, okay? So you'll always know if it's my letter, this is how I always end it, right? And it's his scribbly writing or, you know, however he wrote. All right, let's read the next uh, section there. Paul relieves the, uh, the pressure here. So they're all spun up. They have been quickly shaken. He starts in verse three. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, the day of the Lord, the tribulation time, will not come. Unless the rebellion comes first. That word rebellion, apostasy, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the man of lawlessness, that would be the man antichrist, is revealed. Or the man of sin, some of your translations have, is revealed. It also calls him the son of destruction, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called little g god or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Verse 5. Do you not remember, excuse me, that when I was still with you, I told you these things. We already talked about this. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, and wonders. And I'm ending there with a comma before it goes into verse 10 because it changes a little bit. So first we'll read, uh, we'll look at this one. Paul emphatically advises them, it hasn't happened yet. No, you haven't missed the rapture, verse 1. And no, in verse 2, you haven't missed the day, or you're not in the day of the Lord yet. And I'm going to give you two reasons why. So he goes into the the proof. The day, the seven years of tribulation, has not begun. Paul separates out the rapture from the tribulation. So really, 
when it comes to end times and that, where people place the rapture at the beginning, or if some believe it's in the middle of the tribulation, some believe it's at the end of the tribulation, on one hand, I say, I really don't care. But this is one of the most clearest places because he had to explain it because of what was happening at the time. Please know those are two different events. This one has to happen before this one, and this one hasn't happened yet. So this one, this one hasn't happened yet either because you're still here on earth. All right. So let's, uh, let's look, look at these, uh, these two things. The first one is the, the rebellion. The rebellion, as it has in the ESV, or the apostasy, if you have the King James. Apostasia, apostasy, the departure. We first notice that there's a, there's a definite article right before it. So it's not a apostasy. John talks about that in his epistles, that apostasy takes place. One who claims to be of the faith and then walks away from the faith, and, and that's ultimately what it's talking about there. Paul actually talks about this in more detail in 1 Timothy chapter 4, right in the beginning. I'll just read it. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, in the end days, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who, and here's a couple of things that they'll be teaching that isn't true, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created. Praise God, that doesn't exist. We can eat whatever he's called us to eat. Uh, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Well, there, there's an aspect of this that those who depart from the faith can real believers Born again, believers actually depart from the faith? I would say no, but some believe that, that it's speaking to that. Or is it those that are professing believers? Are they, I'm not going to get into that whole topic right here because I don't have time, but we'll, we'll hit that in another time. But with that, it's, it's first of all, the apostasy that there's going to be a huge falling away. Hasn't happened yet. It's always happening in micro, but it, it, it hasn't happened at this scale. That's number one. The, the second one that takes place is... The man of lawlessness, the Antichrist as we call him, the man of sin will be revealed. And if he's already revealed, then yes, in fact, you have missed the rapture, right? Okay, so the second thing that would have to take place is that he would be revealed, but he hasn't been revealed yet. He's actually the start gun, if you will, of the tribulation. And so we'll just kind of run through a number of words on this, uh, the word described and kind of verse 3b and 4, and that's, you see behind me is what we're hitting. I left it on the left part of the screen so you can read it. So he's described first as the man of lawlessness or the man of sin, speaking of his character. It's who he is at his core. He's unalterably opposed to God. That, that's pretty much what we read as we're going through, that he just hates everything about God. He's, he's the act. The, the opposite of what God represents, his character would be the opposite of that. If you can control political, economic, and religious power, you have a formula then for controlling the world. And we have different world leaders at different times tried to control all of those different areas. Like in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar and his gold image. That was local to his region, but making people, raising up an image of himself that people would bow down and worship, which sounds like Revelation 13 with the Antichrist. So we have in Revelation 13, the Antichrist, the false prophet who makes, who's kind of his religious, he's kind of his prophet, his religious guy, his, his front man, and he raises up this image of the, the, the beast, whatever that looks like. For a long time, you know, back in the 80s here, just coming out, just talking about holograms and, uh, you know, that maybe it's something like that because it says that it, it, it starts talking and speaking. I remember the first time into Dubai, coming down an escalator and kind of looking around. I mean, they have so much money into their airport and I'm just tripping out on everything, looking around. I get to the bottom of the escalator and I'm greeted by a hologram. And it's this Saudi dude dressed in his white long gown and everything else greeting me in perfect English. And it's like, that's impressive. You're walking around this whole thing in 360 and it's lit up there at the thing. And it, it was trippy. Anyway, so maybe that's it. I don't know. Whatever the image of the beast is going to be, I'm not sure. But back in John's day in the Roman Empire, when he's writing the Revelation in the Roman Empire, it was the cult of emperor worship. People were forced to sacrifice to an image of the emperor, known as emperor worship. And so through that, you know, throughout history, other beasts have raised their ugly heads, but none compare to the one to come. He will be the tyrant of tyrants, the dictator of dictators. He will be Nero, 
Genghis Khan, Ivan the Terrible, Lenin, Stalin, uh, Mussolini, Pol Pot, Ceausescu, Hitler, Idi Amin, and Osama bin Laden, all wrapped in one, and then times a billion. And I say times a billion because he will have something none of them had. He will be possessed by Satan himself, just like Judas Iscariot was when he left the Last Supper. And it says, and Satan empowered him. The only two people we know, Judas and this man Antichrist, and there's a number of, of, of connections to those two being Satan possessed. So the son of destruction or the son of perdition is the next name that, that, that Paul gives to him, speaking of his doom to destruction, like his forerunner Judas experienced. And so he's given the exact same title Judas was back in John 17, 12. It says this, I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost. It was Jesus about his sheep, those that were his. And so he says, not one of mine that have been following me have been lost, except the son of perdition or the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. So this word destruction or perdition is a uh, uh, Semitic uh, construction, means he who is destined to be destroyed. And so that's what that, that title simply means. Again, other evil men will come along. We'll call them the small a, antichrist. John says this in his first epistle, 1 John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Charles Ryrie in his commentary adds, but this one is the personification of evil. The cultivation of all that is opposed to God. Great way of summing up who this man will be. Now we can speculate, we can say that could he be living at this time? Yes, yeah. If we believe the rapture is going to happen anytime, he would be alive and well and uh, maybe in politics already because he's going to be a powerful individual. And so with that, could that be? Could he already be? Yeah. But we're not going to speculate on who. But actually, no, I'm just kidding. Antichrist, we usually think of anti, against, and that's, that's what it means, against Christ. But better yet, think of instead of Christ. Like the jealousy that is there, like from, from Lucifer when he was the, created the top angel, right? The archangel for the time. And, and with that, he desires to be God, and then he falls, and it's, it's not... Yes, he is, in fact, against him or opposing, but it's also the saying is, no, I want to be God. Instead of you being God, I want to be God. And, and so it's a, a whole nether level of messed up. John is the only one who uses the term antichrist, and so we have different names for him throughout the Bible. Daniel calls him the little horn. Uh, Paul calls him the man of sin. John in the Revelation calls him the beast out of the sea in the intro to Revelation 13. And Charlie Tuna called him the chicken of the sea. But that's a no, no, different translation. All right. We see with his religion in verse 4, the tribulation is definitely not without religion. Just like today, those outside of Christianity, I believe people are very spiritual. That's why I think it's easy to get into spiritual conversations with people. It doesn't mean that they know God. What I'm saying is there's, there's something wired in every human, I believe, that attracts us to needing a God, knowing that there's a God, that there's something. And yes, can people go long enough and sear their conscience? Yeah, Paul talks about that to Timothy and warning the unbelievers of that, of continuing to resist the Holy Spirit's you know, call in your life. They, they can all of a sudden, your, your minds could be seared in that, in that way for sure. But I think ultimately we're, we're spiritual. We're seeing that there's, there's something beyond myself. There's something outside of myself. That there's something greater than me. And, and they're trying to figure that out. Antichrist, we learn, is very religious, spiritual. He becomes an active member and leader of the first church of me, myself, and I, right? I mean, he's, he's all about worship. He's just in, in, encouraging people to worship him, right? And so he's definitely religious in that sense. Man was made to worship, as is proof here. Everybody wants to worship something, someone, and he's just playing in on that. Here he opposes God. 
He tries to stand in opposition, but he can't, when we say that, he cannot thwart God. He's not, it's not like a a wrestling match. There's a popular picture, because I Google a lot of images for my keynotes and stuff, and there's a popular one of Jesus arm wrestling with the devil. No, 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 no. He's not the opposite of God in the sense that there's no opposite of God. God is so other, he's so transcendent, he's so different. Satan would be an opposite of Michael the archangel, right? He's a fallen angel and an unfallen angel. That's, a, that's an opposite, Fall, an angel to angel kind of thing, right? That would be a good opposite. But being opposite to God, there is no opposite. There's no one in any category to come anywhere close because he is creator and everyone else is created. And so, no. I think I should get an amen there or something, right? I mean, we, we need to say that to the Lord and yeah. I hate talking about Antichrist. I really do. Because there's that, you know, when Paul writes in Ephesians of, of not giving him place, like not giving him, I, I don't talk to him, I don't rebuke him, I don't do anything, I just, I leave him out of all vocabulary. Some people, I'm in the middle of a prayer meeting and praying, they start rebuking the devil and everything else. It's like, I don't want to talk to him. I want to talk to my God. And I, I don't know that, I mean, yes, there's places for that. Yes, I know there's certain places in the Bible, but of doing that, I, I just, uh, that to, to give him time and to give him place, I just don't like doing that. But I'm reading the Bible and it's in here and I have to read it. So we'll keep making Jesus our hero. His religious system, the Antichrist, is connected with the temple. So we know that the temple will re- be rebuilt. There's a whole temple institute there in Jerusalem that has everything set up, blueprints, everything else. So when they get the green light, that they can go on it. That's what they're all about. That's their whole ministry is what they, what they do and want to do that. Not all Jews believe that, but there's some Jewish believers that, that definitely do, and they, they kind of run that. But in Daniel 9, 27, uh, Antichrist, during that seven years of tribulation, he makes his covenant with the Jews to open the temple for them for seven years. Yeah, go for it. But it's in the middle. He breaks in the middle, known as the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 13, where, where he stops that. So the temple is built. He goes in and goes in and defiles the temple and, and takes over at uh, the second half of the tribulation. Remember also, reason why we call the second half the great tribulation, Revelation 12, that's when when Satan gets kicked out of heaven. Not that he lives there or resides there, but he's able to go back and forth and accuse the brethren. But in chapter 12, when that angel says, rejoice up in heaven, but woe unto the earth because he knows he only has a short time left. That's when Satan comes and fills the man Antichrist. So the last three and a half years of that tribulation, things just go crazy. All right. In verse five through seven, this is the hardest part of the whole entire chapter. And I'm being honest with you, like I always try to be with that is, uh, we don't know exactly. Here's the question. Who is this restrainer? I'm going to read it one more time since it's a little puzzling. And you know what is restraining. First, it'll talk about what is restraining, and then it'll talk about who, and it's in the masculine. This one's in the neuter. The other one's in the masculine. You know what is restraining him now, him, the Antichrist now, so that he may be revealed in his time. So he only has this time, right? He's given this time again. He's on a short leash. God always has him on his leash. God is sovereign, and we need to remind ourselves as we go through that. Verse 7, for the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. So uh, what Satan is doing, he's alive and well and working in this planet and people's lives and that, that kind of thing. But it's mysterious. It's behind the scenes. You don't see it. There's going to be a day where the world is going to be able to see it and feel it. But only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So the debate lies here in IDing who is this restrainer. It's, uh, some say it's governments because that's their purpose is to restrain evil, like Romans chapter 13, but I don't think that's it. Uh, some think it's Satan. Well, that doesn't really make sense with verse 7. Him, restrain, him restraining himself, that really doesn't make sense. And so it seems to be, in one sense, the Holy Spirit. Restrain means to hold back and hinder. So something is holding him back. He doesn't just get to run amok. He's held on a leash. And so with that, during that seven years, that's where he's let off leash, so to speak. Still is on leash, but he's allowed more leash, I should say. Like one of those little doggies that they take off. Hit the button and the thing can go out like 50 feet. You know? And then all of a sudden hit the button and brings it back. All right. Sorry. That's how my mind works. 
This was one of the first works of the Holy Spirit recorded when he said this, Genesis 6.3. My spirit shall not strive, that's the Hebrew word saying the same thing, will not strive with man forever, for he is the indeed flesh. So right in the very beginning in Genesis there where it talks about him being a restrainer, here we see possibly that this is the Holy Spirit. Chuck Smith said it this way. Ultimately, you see the Holy Spirit in the believers. Once the Holy Spirit's restraining power through the church is removed, the Antichrist will make his move. So it seems the best my understanding would be is that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit in the lives of his church. Once the church is removed in the rapture, that ultimately that's when his, the start gun goes off and he is released at that point. That seems to be uh, the most prominent, uh, well, I'll just say my understanding of that. So our promise from Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. But once the church is removed, now we can't say, see some say, it's the Holy Spirit that is removed. Uh Uh-uh, no can do. There is a number of salvations during that tribulation time. You cannot get saved without God, without the Spirit of God regenerating a heart. You can do conversion, you can convert, which means, hey, make a, an about face. Matter of fact, that's what we're called to do, is to repent, repent, to turn around, stop going the way of your flesh and turn around and start following Christ, right? So we're our aspect of that, and so it's human and, and divine, and so our, the human side of it is to repent, right, and, and con- convert in that sense, but God is the one who does the regeneration. It's taking something dead and making it alive, and you and I don't have that power to do so, and so he takes a dead spirit inside of us and making it alive, that's being born again, born from above, regeneration. That's what it's, it's talking about there. And I'm out of my notes and I got to find out where I'm at. Okay, hold on. Jesus. <laughs> so, all right, we'll just keep going. Verse seven. I lost track of where I was going. Uh, next is that ultimately then after that, he'll be taken out of the way is the phrasing there. If you take it out of the way. Uh, again, that's where I was. The spirit of God cannot be taken out of the earth because we have a lot of people getting saved. Just read Revelation 7 where uh, uh, Romulo almost quoted it, but uh, to where standing at the throne of God were those that had been martyred out of the tribulation as people out of every tribe and tongue and nation. And so people get saved during that time. And Old Testament, New Testament, millennial reign, everything else, it, it's always a work of God. And so with it, God can't be removed. So it seems to be the Holy Spirit in the church that's removed that lets this happen. Okay, enough said. In verse 8, it talks about Antichrist being killed. This man, Antichrist, again, he's Satan possessed. Satan can't die. He's an eternal spirit in that way. Um, Well, once he was created, now he's eternal, like our spirits will be. Uh, But with that, ultimately, he will be, uh, Antichrist will be killed. And it says in verse 8 how he's going to uh, do it. And then the lawless one, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. And so it's a twofold military strike, his breath and his appearance. Again, this section describes the power of the man of sin, yet its underlying note is the sovereign and almighty power of God. So with that, he is an incredibly powerful being. Satan is, especially in, in, in this man, Antichrist. But again, the hero, as I said earlier, the hero of our story is, is Christ. So what's, what's underneath that is our sovereign, almighty power of God. And so with that, showing it in this sense of, no, I'm going to kill him. His breath. Isaiah 11, 4 says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips... He shall kill the wicked. So we even have Isaiah talking about it back there of what Paul is saying here. Maybe that's what Paul was thinking of when he quoted this. Next, his appearance, or the, uh, I think the New King James says his brightness. His very appearance will destroy him. Not annihilate him, but to render, it means to render inactive or put out a commission. And basically at that time, he is taken out and the Antichrist and the false prophet are the first ones sent to, during the millennial reign, they are sent to uh, the everlasting lake of fire. Actually, first people ever to get there. Everybody else is waiting for hell, waiting to the end of the millennium for that hell gives up the dead, they get judged, and then they're sent to Gehenna or the everlasting lake of fire. But those guys go straight there and uh, that, is their, that is their doom. That's in Revelation 20. I forget the verse, somewhere in there. 
Lastly, they're empowered. He's empowered in verse 9. The man of Antichrist will be Satan-powered, just like Judas, and we already said that. All right, two more sections we've got to get through quick. Those who reject the truth in verse 10 through 12. And with all the wicked deception, still talking about Antichrist, false signs and wonders, and with all, with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing. Here's why. Because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Keep that in your mind. How do I get saved? You have to love the truth. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion. This is judgment for those two things that they're not doing. He sends them strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Upon, the loving, upon loving the truth, we're saved. Not just believing it. Oh, it talks about believing the truth, and we need to, verse 12 and verse 13. But he starts this with talking about loving the truth. The problem isn't believing a lie. The problem is believing the lie. Not just a lie, but the lie. See, everyone's a believer in something. If you refri- refuse Christ in the age of grace... What makes a person think that they're going to receive him in the seven years of tribulation? Like if I miss it here, I'll just, you know, if I see a whole bunch of people get raptured up, okay, then I'll get saved. Well, if you can't do it in the age of grace, why do you make it, why do you make it sound so easy that you're going to get saved here where he's sending a strong delusion, where God sends a strong delusion? It's part of the, 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 the judgment aspect. That's what you want? I'll let you have it. And... Then he does. To those who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, the deepest problem of unbelief is not the inability to affirm facts. You can teach unbelievers facts about the Bible or the lack of awareness that they have like no one ever shared with me. The deepest problem in the world is that fallen human beings do not love truth. We are not by nature people of the truth. We love what serves our fallen appetites, said John Piper. Interesting, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, which is the exact same Greek word as unrighteousness that he he gives us here, but rejoices with the truth. Interesting, on the chapter of love, right in the midst of the chapter of love where it's talking about that, that's where we see the opposite here. Unbelief is always deeper than facts, It's always deeper than the lack of light shining on you from the Lord. It's the love of darkness. Unbelief, then, is because of my love affair with my unrighteousness. That's why a person doesn't get saved. Right there, that he sums up right there. And their condemnation, also in verse 12, their judgment, God gave them a strong delusion. It's it's justified because of what he's giving them, what they're really desiring. You can't go any lower than this. Complete opposition to God and his truth. We'll wrap up in this last section in 13 through 17. I'll first read 13 and 14. Let me, I'm, I'm gonna read it with a little commentary. But we, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. And then he gives because, and then he mentions their source, God chose you as the first fruits or chose you from the beginning to be saved. And so their source of salvation, God himself, their method through sanctification by the Spirit, and their means was their belief in the truth. Again, another blend of divine and human. What God's doing behind the scenes and their expectation to believe in the truth. Verse 14, to this he called you through our gospel so that, here's the goal, that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I couldn't say it better than John Stott, so I'm just gonna, we're just going to quote him. He brilliantly summed it up this way. In the eternity of the past, God chose us to be saved. Listen to that. If you're a believer this morning, hear this. Then he called us in time, causing us to hear the gospel and believe the truth and be sanctified by the Spirit with a view to our sharing Christ's glory in the eternity of the future. In a single sentence, the apostle's mind sweeps from the beginning to the glory. There's no room in such a conviction for fears about Christian instability, the being shaken up, right? Let the devil mount his fiercest attack on the feeblest saint. Let the Antichrist be revealed and the rebellion break out. 
Yet over against the instability of our circumstances and our character, we set the eternal stability of the purpose of God. See, we simply need to glance to chapter 3, verse 3 in our book. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So if you're here this morning and it's just like start freaking out over Antichrist and oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Jump, cheat, jump to chapter 3, verse 3 and remind yourself of your God and his faithfulness and what he's going to do for you and protecting you and leading you and he's the, you know, the author of our faith and he's going to bring it to a conclusion and it's like, breathe. That's what he's telling him, right? It's relieving of the pressure, right? It's breathe, you know, release, release, you know, that, that's what he keeps reminding them. But it's not you doing better. It's not you having better things. It's not you. No, it's you going to your God saying, Lord, I trust in you. Lord, I trust in you. The responsibilities, 15 through 17. Now I'm over time. So then, brothers, stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loves us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Uh, There's a big debate, especially if you come out of uh, Catholicism, uh, where Protestants since the 1500s have stood on sola scriptura, which means the scripture alone. And the Roman Catholic Church has stood on, yes, the Scripture, but also it's Scripture plus tradition. And this is where it's really taken from, where they take it from right here. Because Paul comes out and says, he says, brothers, stand firm and hold to what? The traditions that you were taught by us. And then he even says, even by spoken word or letter. But we have to think about this. This is only the third book out of 27 in the New Testament. They don't have the New Testament. What he's writing to the Thessalonian believers is what we told you in in writing, because now they have one of the first documents. It hasn't been considered canon yet, right, and placed into the New Testament because that hasn't even been put together. It's going to take a couple hundred years for that to all all of those to, to, to be put together, right? But so with that, by the things that we said to you, right, that, that's what they get. Paul speaking that ultimately maybe got written down in one of the letters with that, but soon to be penned. That's how I would say it. Hold fast to the soon to be written down traditions of the apostles. Those are the ones that we would hold to if they were the ones that ended up in Scripture that that would be what, what he's talking about here. Okay, my last quote. I'll invite up the worship team. Here's what we were reminded of this morning. Don't be carbonated Christians, okay? First of all, don't be shaken up. Whatever's going on in your life, don't be shaken. You're not in the tribulation. You didn't miss the rapture either. You didn't have to deal with the, the, the you don't have to deal with the man of lawlessness, at least when he is standing here on earth. Stand firm, he said at the end. Hold on to all that the apostles taught. Our Father loves you. He chose you, is sanctifying you, will glorify you, and presently is giving you eternal encouragement, hope, grace, comfort, and strength in every word and work. That's how he wrapped it up. That's what he was saying in this, and we still get one more chapter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its encouragement. We thank you for the pressure relief that it does in our lives when we get spun up in worry and anxiety or depressed in in just a deep depression. God, we can come back and learn how to lament in you. God, we can come to you for anything and everything that's going on in our lives. We run to you. We say, God, we love you. And we say, Lord, thank you for your precious, precious word. And we thank you that we can lean on you and your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen.